Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for our third session of the Buys and Transport Leadership Series, Keeping Girls in Sport. I'm Leah Hextall, and I'm your host tonight. Thrilled to be here, as always. And the Buys and Transport Leadership Series is designed to empower and inspire women to become leaders in sport, community, and in life. We bring together inspirational leaders from all areas of sport to tell their personal and professional stories, offer valuable advice and guidance, and share practical tips that participants can use on and off the field of play. Sport Manitoba, in partnership with Bison Transport, aspire to increase female engagement in sport by providing an informative, inclusive, and inspirational experience throughout this series. Here's a look into our valued title sponsor, Bison Transport. It started when I was a child. I always thought, I was always amazed by the trucks. And you know, you did the little arm thing and they'd honk at you and I was just amazed. Thing. I want to do that. I love the freedom of the highway. And it's not just a woman, a man's job anymore. Anyone can do it. I was in a classroom with 12 men. I was the only woman in that classroom. I was actually told by a couple of instructors that a woman belongs in a truck, but not behind the driver's wheel. I got out of the truck, went to another school, and I actually found a school where they didn't care whether you're a man or a woman, and I got my license. I didn't give up. Girls can do anything they put their mind to. I would say just do something you love. If driving is what you love, it is a very rewarding career. You really can't change people's minds. They have to change it on their own. You can say, look, I've been doing it for so long. Um, I enjoy it. There's so many women out there. But if they're not, they don't have an open mind, you're not going to change theirs. Women can do whatever they want and put their mindset just like anybody else, you know, like driving a semi is intimidating, but doesn't mean you can't do it so just gotta put your mind to it that's all and be confident if society is telling girls to be something different I would say go against society do what you want to do do what makes you happy being a woman you could do anything there's no boundaries not anymore there was back way in the day before my time but no you could do anything The only person that's going to stop you from doing it is yourself. So it doesn't matter what society says, if you want to do it, then you do it. All right, Bison Transport, thank you so much. A few housekeeping notes for everyone tonight because uh, we want to make sure that you get to see everything that we're talking about in the proper view. If your internet quality is poor, look for the click here to switch stream and then click on it. That allows you to view it at a lower bandwidth. Your video quality will decrease, but your audio quality should remain the same. And if you're having any technical issues, you can click on the request help bubble on the bottom right corner of the webcast page and your help request will be emailed back to the email address that you provided. And lastly, throughout tonight's session, we encourage you to ask questions using the question box on the right-hand side of the webcast and to engage on social media, whether that be Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, you name it, tag Sport Manitoba in your posts and use the hashtag leadership, capital H-E-R there. So we start this evening's Bison Transport Leadership Session, Keeping Girls in Sports, with the rally report. And this is important. Canadian Women in Sport, the leading voice and authority of women in sport in Canada in partnership with Canadian Tired Jumpstart Charities and research by IMI International explored the current Canadian trends in sport participation with a specific focus on girls ages 6 to 18. Let's see what they learned in the rally report. Sport has so many benefits from physical health to leadership development to socialization to mental health. 
Unfortunately, the latest research by Canadian Women and Sport in partnership with Canadian Tire Jumpstart Charities continues to show that most women and girls are not realizing these benefits. Just over half of 6 to 12 year old girls participate in sports. By age 16, that number falls to 47%. By their late teens, one out of every three girls who used to play sports has dropped out. Just one in 10 boys have dropped out. Participation continues to fall dramatically as just 18% of adult women participate in sport. A top reason why girls leave. Girls report significant declines in quality of their sport experience as they get older. In other words, sport stops meeting their needs and interests. One size does not fit all. To keep girls in sport, we need to do things differently. Here are two ways how. First, put the participant at the center of your plans. Designed deliberately for girls. Second, involve women and girls from diverse backgrounds in planning and delivering sport. Whether you're a parent, a coach, an administrator, or a journalist, you can make a difference. Inclusion of women and girls in sport makes sport better for all. Together, let's change the game so everyone wins. Take action at womenandsport.ca. All right, the CEO of Canadian Women and Sport is Alison Sandmeyer Graves. And Alison works closely with researchers, government decision makers, sport administrators, media, and other influencers across the country to drive learning and action on gender equity in sport. She brings 15 years of experience to her role. Her career has been rooted in social impact with a focus on mobilizing large scale lasting change. Alison is motivated by the power of sport and believes that inclusive, Equitable sport can help advance equity for women in all areas of society. Allison, I am so thrilled to have you here with us. And I just have to say, watching that, it almost gives me a bit of anxiety and a panic attack. So the floor is yours, ladies. So please give us some more information about what you've learned. Thanks, Leah. It's such a pleasure to be back here again. Um, sport Manitoba is just providing some great leadership, obviously supported by their partners. And um, this is such an important conversation. As you saw from the video, and I'll elaborate on some of these points, um, there is work to be done. So let's dive in. You heard this as part of my bio. It's so deeply what I believe, and it really is at the core of our organization, Canadian Women in Sport, is that this is bigger than sport. It's totally about sport, and yet so much more than that. Uh, it's about um, enabling and empowering women to realize their full potential in every area of their life within sport, but also well beyond sport as well. And we really believe that there's big change possible from more women playing, more women leading, more women telling the stories. Uh, and uh, we are as an organization committed to supporting those who want to see that change really bring that to life in their work. So our impact on the next slide really speaks to the kind of work that we do. We, uh, this, most of this is from the last year, year and a half. Uh, we work extensively with leaders, helping them to develop their understanding of the issues and the solutions and really building their capacity to take action. We work with organizations. And this is where our work really comes to life because there are great organizations working directly with the girls. For us, we're interested in changing the system, that lasting change, so that, you know, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, as girls come in and explore sport for themselves, they're getting an increasingly rich and rewarding experience and one that really wants, uh, makes them want to stay in sport. And then we're a big voice on this topic as well. We are out, um, you know, advocating for women in sport and doing what we can to really make sure that a gender lens is being brought to decisions and to the stories that get told about sport and about the people who play it. So as Leah introduced, we uh, did a big report that came out last May with research that we gathered just before the, the um, pandemic really sank in. And so the rally report on the next slide um, really sets a bit of a baseline for us right now, actually, as we're deep into COVID-19, we're starting to do some more research to understand how the pandemic is impacting the current experiences of girls and women 
most of whom cannot continue in the sports that they love at the moment, but also their intentions around that. And we have this great report from May that really gives us a sense of where we were at um, as the pandemic started to settle in. Again, this was a national um, survey that we did. We talked to 10,000, not myself directly, but 10,000 different people, um, parents, girls themselves, parents of girls, parents of boys, uh, to really understand What's going on? How are girls participating? Are they participating? What's their experience of participation? And what can we really learn about their, their experience and their journey within sport that can help us to better understand how to support them, how to create safe, welcoming and inclusive environments and experiences for them. It was a very large study. The last one of its kind happened four years ago. So we were really curious also to see what's changed, what hasn't changed, um, and what new insights can we bring to the conversation? And really it is about having a conversation. So some of our key findings, there was a bit of some spoilers on this within the video, but if you wouldn't mind advancing just a couple of slides. Um, as you heard, one in three girls are dropping out of sport versus one in 10 boys. This isn't new, unfortunately. This is fairly consistent with data that we've been seeing for a while. I think what's interesting is that if you layer onto that, the understanding that overall sport participation across the genders is going down. So fewer people in Canada are participating in sport. And then within that, you see there's such a divide that emerges within women, well, initially boys and girls, and then women and men. So you see on that graph there on the far left, that's when kids are, you know, six to eight years old. And we see that at that point in time, girls are mixing it up in sport just as much as boys. They're in there, they're enjoying it. And then you see just right quickly after that, the gender gap starts. And it gets pretty wide as you go along, which means, of course, that women and girls are accessing the benefits of sport for their lives far less than men and boys are. And we want to close that gap. So why does that gap exist? There are lots of reasons. Here's what the girls themselves told us. And you'll see that on the next slide, if you wouldn't mind advancing it. A lot of it can be summed up as quality, but I'm going to break it down for you a little bit more. You saw that in the video, they said girls reported uh, feeling that the quality of their sport experience went down as they grew older. What they also said was <clears throat> their confidence, the barriers or their, the lack of confidence and the barrier that their confidence uh, presented just skyrockets as they go into those early teen years. Their sense of their skill really dropped. They felt that their, their skills and their abilities were a barrier to them uh, continuing to play. That may be because as they get older, often there's an expectation that the level of competition increases and there aren't as many, <clears throat> excuse me, aren't as many options still available to, to them to play recreationally. But also there is, you know, those that confidence and those skills really go hand in hand. Their sense, the perception of their skills uh, became weaker. Concerns about body image really rises as they go into those teen years. Concerns about social barriers like bullying and not feeling like they belong go up. Injury goes up. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's, that's a long list of things that can ultimately lead girls to feel as though sport is not a place where they want to spend their, their downtime. And when you consider that there are lots of other pushes and pulls on their time at that moment, when they're really starting to develop their sense of self and their sense of independence, um, sport is having a hard time maintaining their interest and really serving the needs that they have. If all of these barriers are going up as they go into um, their adolescence within sport, how is sport responding to that and really doubling down on the things that those girls need to stay in the game? It's key to remember that not all girls experience sport in the same way. And as you see in the next slide and in the report, uh, we made an effort to bring an intersectional lens to this study. Admittedly, 
there is more that can be done on this, absolutely. And I think that this study raised a lot of questions for us, um, in a lot of cases more than answers. Um, we don't, don't know enough through this report and through the body of research that exists about the experiences of girls from different backgrounds um, who have different identities that impact and intersect with gender to create more additional barriers for them. And that may be a case of uh, disability, it may be a case of ethnicity or indigeneity, it may be a case of culture, there are lots of uh, income, there are lots of different layers to identities that ultimately mean that if we take only a gender lens in looking at these issues, we're going to miss some really important understandings and some really important interventions that we can use to ensure that all girls have access to and stay in sport. And of course, a key part of that is women in leadership positions as well. Who are the people with power in the sport system? Who are the people defining the sport experience? And as you'll see in the next slide, we have seen some improvements. There are more women leading at the national level of sport. Coaching remains pretty stagnant. And that, of course, is one of the most influential roles that shapes the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week experience of girls in sport. We know that having more women coaching creates, um, creates environments and experiences that are really conducive to girls having a strong experience. And that doesn't mean that men can't be incredibly effective coaches for girls. Uh, but what we do know is that having more women in that space is not only good for the women who want to coach, but it's great for the girls too, because it provides them with those real life authority figures and role models that they can connect with within their daily sport experience. So what do we make of this as people who want to make a difference? Here are some of our key takeaways and recommendations. Um, and so I'll just pause on the next slide for a moment. I think the, the really important takeaway that I wanna leave with you today, and I hope you take away from reading the report is that sport is highly gendered. As the video said, there is no one size fits all, uh, but uh, it has been built on a male model. For years and years and generations, sport has been built and, and replicated on a male model. And so we need to understand that gender is baked into a lot of the ways we do things in sport, from, from the culture and the informal parts of it to the policies and the ways that we structure things. And so whether we acknowledge it or not, this is at play. So let's call it out, let's name it, so that we can start to see it and act on it. We need to intentionally account for the, the role that gender plays, and as I said, some of those other identity factors. The good news is, of course, that we can do something about this. So one of the uh, top takeaways that I would leave you with is to lead with equity, which you'll see on the next slide. So what does that mean? <laughs> equity versus equality. Uh, we hear both of them used interchangeably. Um, and really, there's nothing really wrong with that per se, but they are different concepts. And whereas equality would say everyone is welcome, come one, come all, you know, we, we want you here. What equity really says is we want you here and we have designed with your needs and interests in mind. We want you to have the same outcomes and the same benefits from being here as others do. So whether you're coming as a woman, whether you're coming as a woman with a disability, what you need to be successful within sport has been accounted for in the way we've designed it. And that really requires us to use a gender lens to recognize that when we say gender neutral or you know this sport is for everyone we're probably missing a lot of the things that make sport different for women and girls and the things that they need or the things that we could do to set them up for success in that space that might be different than what others need and the more that we do this at a policy level the better so often we see individual champions who are really committed to this and so dedicated to bringing this to, out through their work. What we really want to see is this becomes embedded as a priority within the programs or within the organizations and that everyone is working from the same page and contributing to the girls having that strong experience. 
my next takeaway is to put girls at the center, as you saw in the video, and design specifically for the girls. Let's not leave things to chance. There is a lot that's been written on this, a lot of tips, a lot of best practices, and you can find many of those on our website and we'd be happy to share them with you. In the absence of that, or to add to that, talk to the girls. The girls in your space might be different than girls in other spaces, whether it's the community that they're part of or their particular backgrounds or the uniqueness of your sport or your physical activity environment. So this whole idea of we designed for you in mind really rests on you talking to the girls and understanding what it is that they're looking for, what motivates them, what makes them excited to show up, what makes them think twice about coming out? And then to take that really seriously, pay attention also to the things that the girls reported in the rally report, skill development, self-confidence, body image, injury, social belonging, and intentionally intervene in each of those areas. If we're not designing specifically for that outcome, then there's a good chance that it won't, it won't just happen on its own. That means we may need to write, rewrite some playbooks, so to speak. And I can't recommend enough going beyond the technical and tactical. That has been very much a male model of sport is to focus on the X's and O's. But we know girls as well as boys, and this is not unique to girls. They need the social and emotional support. They need coaching on that as much as they need coaching on how to catch, throw, run a play, what have you. Because all of these things, social belonging, self-confidence, body image, that's not X's and O's. That's the whole person that we need to focus on. So there are lots of resources available. You can learn more at some of the links on the next slide. And I'd be happy to share more as we go along and in the networking at the end of this. Um, and looking forward to diving into the conversation on this. Thanks so much. Allison Samai Graves, uh, what incredible information in that presentation. And you know, it just makes so much sense. You wanna change things, go to the source talk to the girls, you know, lasting change, you got to change the system. So many key words there that you have brought forward to us tonight. And Allison's going to stick with us tonight. But as Allison knows, we have two other incredible incredible women that are joining us here on the Buys and Transport Leadership Series Session 3, Keeping Girls in Sports. So why don't we go and learn a bit more about these two ladies? Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Watson and I am the West Highway Operations Manager for Buys and Transport. I am very pleased and honoured to have been asked to introduce your speakers for tonight's event. Tonight's guests are prominent female figures leading the way for change. Our first guest is Michelle swatsky Coop. Michelle grew up in Steinbeck, and indoor volleyball has always been her sport. A bronze medalist at the 1989 Canada Summer Games, a three-time national champion at the University of Manitoba, and a two-time U Sport Player of the Year. Michelle's university career was topped off by being named U of M Female Athlete of the Year. Michelle was a setter for the senior national team from 1993 to 1996. In that time, she led Team Canada to a bronze medal at the Pan Am Games in 1995, and a ninth place finish at the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta. This is where her team won the first games won by a woman's team at any Olympics ever. Michelle was constantly underestimated because of her short stature, but her love of the game allowed her to navigate every obstacle that she faced. She loves sharing her story and is honored to have done so across Canada. Our next guest is Amber Balkin. Amber is a third generation race car driver. She started racing go-karts at the age of 10. And in 2016, she became the first Canadian female to win a NASCAR sanctioned race in the United States. She has now moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to pursue her NASCAR racing dreams and is currently training for her biggest race to date this February at Daytona. Amber has overcome a lot of adversity to get to where she is today and is one of motorsports largest female influencers. She truly believes that with hard work, determination and a positive mindset that anything is possible. Welcome to everyone. All right, well with that, we welcome in Michelle and Amber and Allison is gonna stick around and join us this evening. So Michelle, Amber, welcome tonight. Thank you so much for lending your time. We're thrilled to have both of you here. So thank you so much. 
Um, so Michelle, I'm going to start right off with you. Let's get it out of the way. How tall are you, girl? Uh, five foot six at my tallest. I've probably shrunk a little, but. <laughs> you know, and that's not short. That, that is not short. But in your sport, and I know from talking to that national team, we were chatting a little bit about it, the fact that back in my day, I had a, a wonderful chance to interview you when you were the national team mm -hmm. here when they resided in Winnipeg. But you're an Olympian. You're a Pan Am medalist. You have done it all within your sport, but yet your entire volleyball career, you know, you were told that you weren't tall enough you were underestimated i don't think this is anything new for a lot of women in sport mm -hmm. so how did you feel when you were faced with that and how did you overcome that well you know when i started volleyball i was i mean i i was i got to be five foot six in grade like nine beginning of grade nine and i was done growing you know and um my husband grew four inches after high school my sons i have twin boys that are 18 they're still growing i don't know how that's fair but you know uh but it was a challenge i always faced and um, I was cut from three provincial teams and mostly just based on my height. And, you know, um, when I finally, you know, got asked to play on, on this third provincial team because, you know, a couple of girls had quit the team, you know, quite, they were quite desperate for my attendance and, you know, as proud as I was and as much as I wanted them to sort of, you know, nice try, you know, you cut me three times and out of here. Um, I could never let go of the what ifs, you know, and I loved the game so much that I wanted to keep playing it. So I, I, um, I took their desperate offer. And really, that was, you know, the moment that I decided uh, um, that I had to do something with what I had. And that was my heart and my head. And, and uh, even, even right through university, three national championships and all of those things, um, even after university, when you want to make the national team, you know, um, as far as everyone had indicated I would be probably would have been the top setter in Canada. But in my meeting with the national team coach, he flat out said, you will never play international volleyball because you're far too small, but you know, I owe you this tryout. So, you know, we'd really like you to come. And, and um, so I went, but I, I had really gone and committed to just not trying, you know, I was going to go and just have fun for three weeks and get out of there, you know, and I was still five and six jeepers. I was 23, you know, and, um, and I made that team little by little, you know, little by little. And every every little little taste I got, I wanted to stay longer. And no matter what they said, I wanted to, you know, I always felt like when I stuck around, when I stuck around, good things seemed to happen. And I think one of the things that carried me a lot was my high school coach. And she was a woman. Shannon Kaler is her name now. She was Shannon Ormiston at the time. She came out to Steinbeck, bless her soul, came to a small town to teach high school phys ed. And she always said, like, why not you? Why can't you? Why not you? Keep going. There's something about you, Michelle, that all those tall girls play better when you're on the court. And that was my ticket. It wasn't just about me. And that's another thing I think that kept me in it was it couldn't just be about me. And um, even to make a very long story short, but even, even um, a couple of months before the Olympics, um, uh, I was on the court when we qualified. I had been the starting setter on the national team for three years. I had done my proving. I had proven to them. We beat teams like Germany and Italy that we'd never beaten before in the history of Canadian women's volleyball. And it was spirit and heart and leadership. And um, uh, when we went to the Olympics, I don't know who, who, you know, if anyone's old enough to have watched the 96 Olympics. No, Leah, I know you were there uh, or, or watching, but you know, but um, uh, at the beginning, I didn't play. I started for three years and I didn't play the first three matches because the coach really felt we couldn't compete at an Olympic Games because of my height solely. And you'd think, my goodness, by then, you know, has she not proven herself? And my role at the Olympics for the first three matches was sitting right on the bench. And, and you couldn't believe the response and the outpouring of emails and, and correspondence I got from Canadians and Manitobans that said, why aren't you playing? We are losing. Why aren't you on the court? And I and um, I had I had purposed in my mind before we left the Olympics that I would love the experience no matter what. Uh, that wasn't just so easy. It took me a couple of hours of, you know, really wanting to lose it uh, in my apartment when I got the news that I wouldn't be starting at the Olympics. And uh, we were we were losing quite badly. And he, so he finally said, you know, well, I get you know, oh, would you want to go in, you know, and and uh, sure enough, uh, went back in and we had our lineup back on and ended up winning our last match against Peru. And we made history. And, you know, never before or after has a Canadian women's team won that match. And 
and, and I and I don't say that because look what I did. I want girls to see, and I want athletes to see what's possible, you know. And I and I knew that when I went to the Olympics, and I knew my role was to be on the bench, and I really felt in my heart that's not where I belonged. But I knew that what I could control was how I reacted because I could not put myself on the court. I was not the head coach. And um, I just knew that if I got the call, if I had got the call, I had to be ready. And, uh, and I was, and I was, and I went on the court and we were facing Russia and the tallest girl was six foot nine and it was ridiculous. And, you know, I was just this little girl and a bunch of big trees, but I, you know, sort of ran my little machine, my little Canadian machine and, and we beat Peru in the end. And, and it was incredible. And I think what kept me going was the encouragement of that coach that I had in high school. She never let me stop. Um, the encouragement of like my parents, my dad, who's shorter than me. Thanks a lot, dad, um, for nothing in the height department, but everything in the heart and spirit department. And, um, he reminded me how awesome I was all the time on the quarter off. And I think that's important. And it helped me love where I was and appreciate the opportunities I had. So, um, right till the bitter end, it was tough. Um, but I, I just, like I said, I couldn't let go of the what ifs and every girl that exists has a what if there's always what if because you always have tomorrow and you never know what's coming and if you if you let up for a second you just might miss it and I just couldn't miss it and so I'm really happy I held on and and uh, worked as hard as I could to leave you know at least as little as possible up to chance all right well thank you very much ladies and gentlemen this has been Michelle Swaski's TED talk good night uh, <laughs> so that was awesome like so many key factors in there which are so important and just the perseverance and the confidence that you had Michelle and you know Amber when you know when Michelle speaks of what ifs for you I think who thinks about being a race car driver especially as a female so please take me in to how you got into this sport yeah, so I grew up in a racing family. My dad still races to this day. My mom's father raced and her brother raced and all my cousins. But I was the only female in the family, just a bunch of boys. And I saw them racing. They started in go-karts. And when I was young, I begged and begged my dad to let me race. And my mom said, you know, she's not going to stop. So you might as well let her. And he year after year he still wouldn't let me and my mom said look my dad wouldn't let me race back in that generation this is a new generation because i'm a female um and you need to let her race and uh my first race i got second my second race i won and kind of proved like hey i i can be here i can do this too and um the only thing that's really different between everyone else in my family that races and myself is i'm the only one who said that i want to make it a career so I went to Red River College in Winnipeg and went did my two year business admin and I went to the U of M. I was about a month or two into class and I was daydreaming about racing and I kind of had my aha moment and I was like, you know what, like, what do you want to do with your life, Amber? What do you want? And the only thing I could think about was racing. I was like, I want to be a race car driver and I want to do it for the rest of my life. And I went home that day to my parents and I said, I'm going to drop out of you. Not, I'm not encouraging people to drop out of school. Not <laughs> school's great, but um, I went to my parents and I said, I want to drop out of school and I want to pursue racing as a career. At that point, it had been a hobby. I had still had a lot of success as a hobby, but I wanted it to be a career. And my dad said, do you know how difficult that's going to be? And I said, yeah, it's probably going to be pretty difficult. I didn't know how actually difficult it was going to be, but um, they said, you know, obviously we can't financially support you, but we morally support you. And that was when I was 21. So uh, seven years ago and the last seven years I've been hustling and, and trying to make this a career. It's been quite a journey. <laughs> You know, Amber, it would be such a journey and adding to that, as you just said, you know, not only in your sport, but in your family, you were the only female, but you are in a very male dominated sport. And, you know, that's hard in so many, as Allison has said, it's not just about sport in society. There's so many male dominated careers, but I'm interested to see how you have navigated and to go back to something that Allison said about women and girls feeling safe in their space. When you are in a male dominated sport where there is no one who looks like you around, have you felt safe in your space and how have you navigated that within your career? You know what, it's, 
I've always felt like the racetrack and being in the race car, that's when I've felt the most at home. That's when I felt the most confident. That's when it, when I felt the most like me. And I feel very lucky to be in a sport that men and women compete at the same level. They, you know, they, there isn't a women's league and a men's league. We compete together. And, you know, some people might see that as a negative, but I see that as a positive. And I, I think that's a great opportunity and I'm grateful for it. So for me to even get to be part of that 42 that tries to compete at the NASCAR level is amazing. And, you know, the number one question I get is what is it like being a female male dominated sport? And my answer is, I've only ever been a female in a male dominated sport. So th this is how my life's been my whole life. So I, I don't know anything else. Um, the things that I have learned is to try to actually put that out of my mind because when I was younger, I, I, it was evident that I was a female and not only a female, but a feminine female, um, one that likes to have her nails done and wear makeup. And because of that, I wasn't always taken seriously until I got on the track and, and proved it with my results. But um, I think the biggest piece is to try not to see yourself so differently and just know that when that helmet goes on, you don't know if I have lipstick on or not. I'm a race car driver. I'm not a male or female. I'm a race car driver. So I think that is so great about my sport is one of the helmets on gender is not an issue. It's not, no one knows what gender I am. I'm, I'm just a driver. And um, now a little bit later in my career, I just really try to, to think about that. You know, I'm not a female race car driver. I'm a race car driver and I have the ability and the dedication and the grit and the talent and the work ethic that all my counterparts do or all my competitors do, if not more. I personally think I work a lot harder than all of them um, to make up for it. You know, men sometimes naturally have, you know, different muscles or, or bigger muscles. So I'm going to work out at the gym twice as hard. I just use it to push me forward. I use it to elevate me. Um, and again, I just, I try not to see the differences as a bad thing. I try to just kind of keep, keep my eye on the ball to, as so to speak. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think, Amber, when, you know, you're speaking about it and also with yourself, Michelle, you both have had such great success in your sporting careers in your given sport but not every young girl is going to end up achieving the levels in which both of you had so many might look at it and say well girls don't have those type of opportunities that boys have so no wonder they're dropping out at a faster rate than young men but that being said i am a big believer i never was a professional athlete like both of you but i know what sports has brought to my life and i'd like to turn to you michelle you have twin boys as you mentioned what are the skill set that you learned within your athletic career whether you made it as an olympian or not that still impacts you to this day as a grown woman in your everyday life oh no question um perseverance uh confidence um just believing that i could you know, do what I set my mind to doing, even if, like you say, even when I wasn't, um, even when I was in high school, when I was in high school, just playing on my high school team, uh, we worked hard every day and to, and to know that we could do that. And I'll tell you what, when I had the twins I, I, for the first three months, I felt like I hadn't learned anything. I, I just realized that what women do in becoming mothers is the hardest thing ever. Uh, people were always very interested in what I did with a little bully ball. You know, it was very good. It made it national television, but keeping two human beings alive at the same time didn't make any Carolyn like newspapers or nothing. So, you know, but, but what it, what it taught me, what sport taught me was to take care of what I could control every day. And that broke life down for me. Um, when I was done the Olympics, I got an opportunity to be on the radio and I still co-host a morning show on the radio. Well, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that if I learned every little thing and I was okay to be bad at first, you know, it's like being a mom. I was okay to be bad at first. I guess I had to be, cause I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I don't know who does. If you do raise your hand, you're a pro. Um, but I think sport taught me that it also taught me that there's always people around you that can be a part of your team. And if you have a team around you um, and sport, you know, they, in sport, we talk about teams a lot, even in an individual sport, right? Like Amber, I'm sure you have found your support team, right? In car racing, you have your support team. 
actually though a lot of people think racing is an individual sport but it's actually a team sport i have a crew chief i have a spotter i have a gas man i have with if my crew's not performing if my spotter is not telling me where the cars are then it, it could be an absolute disaster so racing actually is still very much a team sport we the drivers just get all the accolades <laughs> or all the all the stardom but it's really a team sport yeah yeah and and to learn to play a role i think sport taught me how to learn to play a role and the role you're given and to find joy in it. You need to find joy, convince yourself to find the joy in it. And I tell you what, sitting on the bench going Olympics, I was not feeling joyful. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, it was the most unfair moment of my life. I felt for a moment um, till I saw myself in my bathroom mirror and I wasn't looking so attractive, being so terribly angry and so terribly selfish. And I knew that I had to, that I was part of a team and that it was bigger than that. And that's like life too. So, yeah, Amber, what about for yourself? Everything that I've learned in racing has translated over to my life. Like every every disappointment, every failure, every success, everything that I've learned, everything translates to my life. And I know 100% that I wouldn't be the person I am today if I wasn't in sports, if I didn't pursue racing, if I didn't put myself in these uncomfortable, challenging situations. Sports are challenging but they make you better and they build you up and they make you stronger and they make you a better person and i you know i think almost every girl when they're in high school or or junior high they're they lack confidence they lack self-esteem and it takes a while to build that and i think sports really help build that and they help build that reassurance within yourself and um, they let you know that you can do anything and, and going back to what Michelle said, you know, it's just, it's about kind of making those daily habits and putting it in, putting in the work, putting in the work. And then eventually you start to see the results and there's a lot of failures along the way, but there's those little victories too. And you hold on to those little victories to keep propelling you forward. And, um, there's just, there's so many parallels between sports and life and everything you learn in sports, you can learn in your life. And I, I really, truly believe that they make you a better person. They make you a better partner. They make you a better businesswoman. They make you better in all areas of your life. Like I, I can't even give enough gratitude towards how much racing has built me into the woman I am today. And Allison, that just hits it right there. Because when we look at that statistic, one in three girls are dropping out by 18 and people may say, well, you know, does that really matter? That's why it matters. All those intangible and transferable skills. So when we talk about girls sport, and this is actually a question from the audience that I just received, but I have interest in well too. Are girls dropping out because unlike boys, they don't have a chance to make millions of dollars as professional athletes? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm sure that, that there is that direct correlation for some girls, absolutely, in terms of what motivates them and, and their ability to see a future for themselves. I think a lot of it more broadly comes down to, to the stories that we tell and the stories that we're told. And boys are told a very different story than girls are about what sports should mean to them. And there, you know, there's a lot of cultural reinforcement of boys playing, playing sports, competing, being aggressive, being strong, um, and it being a place where men come together and where they find community and where they bond and where they turn into men. Women don't get told those stories. Girls don't get told those stories. And I think that uh, women and girls often get criticized and said, well, they just don't like it. It's like, well, <laughs> we're told that we're supposed to like other things our whole lives. And in fact, women in sport that we do see on our screens um, have a hard time often. They're, they are criticized and they are torn down in ways that male athletes aren't. It's, it's different. And so there are a lot of very, very powerful narratives that um, we're starting to counteract, but we have a long way to go. And I think that's, that also comes down to the, the coaches and the, the program leaders and things like that. You're not just dealing with this bubble of your team in your gym or on the field or wherever. 
all of society is pushing and pulling on these girls. And if we want to keep them in sport, we need to be aware of those pressures and intentionally counteracting them and bringing new narratives to these girls that help them understand the value of what sport can do for them, irrespective of whether there's a professional future for them. But let's also work to make sure that that opportunity exists for them. Yeah, and Allison, that, that's just so key. You know, when you talk about the narrative that is given to young boys as they grow up about sport compared to young girls, and that's where, you know, this word has become such a buzzword in 2020, representation matters. I've heard it more and more. I have said it myself. I <laughs> don't believe in it. But it's just when I'm listening to you about the narrative that's told to young boys, I'm wondering, you know, does representation matter as much as we think it does? And what does that look like? I think it matters a great deal. So when you consider the statistic that only about 4% of media focuses on women's sport, that means 96% goes to men's sport. When girls turn on the television or open, I don't know, do people open newspapers anymore, but open the pages of the newspaper, you know, they're not seeing themselves. But if their brother does or their friend or what have you, they're just, they're just so many stories glorifying men's sport and and women are just absent they're just absent so like our culture tells us indirectly or directly that men belong in sport and women don't um, and that may sound extreme but i think that you know that has that's that's been this pervasive um narrative and when women are missing it reinforces the idea when they're missing from the picture, it reinforces this idea that they don't belong there. So I think the presence of people like Amber, just by virtue of being there, you challenge that narrative, you challenge that status quo. And I think that that is, that's a very powerful thing. And I think what we want to do is move past women being an outlier and to normalize their presence in sport and, and to take it even further to ensure that they have the power to shape it, not just to be participants in sport, but to be the ones defining sport. So that I think is the long journey that we're on. Um, and that is why I think it's really important to celebrate women whose very presence in a sport and success in a sport uh, is starting to change sport, but let's make sure they're not the last and that we take it even further. And Amber, I don't wanna put the weight of your gender right on your shoulders here, but as uh, you know, as was just referenced, you know, you just being there, your presence, taking up that literal space of being a driver, you know, how do you use that to push for progress? Sorry about that, I was muted. <laughs> uh, I think it's a very important for me to be a positive role model and take on this responsibility. I that one of the reasons why I have never given up in this journey, even though it's been really difficult, is because I do want to be that person that little girls can look up to and say, wow, if Amber can do that, if Amber can be there, then I can do that too. For me, when I was younger, it was Danica Patrick. She was in the Cup Series. If I didn't see a woman that high level, I don't know if I would know that that was even possible. So for me to be that representative is super important and not only be that representative and take up that space, but make sure that I'm working my absolute hardest being as disciplined as I can to prove to people, not only can I be there, but I can win races, I can win championships, I can make history. And if I can do that, you guys can do that too. So I think the biggest thing is like you said, being there, showing that it's possible, showing that I am equally as talented, if not more than these guys. And then also giving back to the, the younger generation. I'm a part of this group called Shift Up Now, and we're all about just educating younger women about how they can get into racing and really just being there for them and being their guides, being their mentors. I never had a mentor, a female mentor in, in racing. I just had to kind of learn things on my own. And I can only imagine what it'd be like if I had someone kind of help leading the way with for me. So I think it's really important for me to not only 
strive to be the best driver I can be, the best athlete I can be and, and win and do as much as I can on the track, but also off the track and, and give back in all the ways I can and use my experience, my failures, my mistakes and use that knowledge and experience and give it back to the girls so that it can be a little bit easier for them. And Michelle, for yourself, you for the past late uh, eight years have been coaching your son's volleyball team. Yeah. So here we are, a female coach for young men. And when we talk about representation, I have to think that is going to change them for life. Am I mistaken? No, I think I think you're right. I think it's a uh, it was a unique situation for my boys to have their mom uh, on the bench. It was unique for me. Um, it was unique in many ways. And um, I think in my time coaching them, of course, you coach your children where it's needed, right? And they needed a coach, and and volleyball is my sport and they loved volleyball and um there were definitely times where i felt you know definitely a little insecure on the boys side and you think well you went to the olympics how would you feel insecure about anything in regards to volleyball well i never played men's volleyball and there are some differences in terms of physicality uh boys younger are doing different kind of plays maybe than girls are but fortunately since i made it to the top of the sport i would say the, the ladies playing at the olympics still hit the ball about a, a ton more than high school boys. So I sort of had seen it all and I'd seen, you know, that kind of strength and that kind of jump. So I knew what I was dealing with, but um, I, I think what was, there are a couple of things that were really interesting about being sort of, well, almost the only woman in a gym full of men, um, except for the, the moms watching and the sisters watching um, was that a lot of the male coaches as, as we started to compete and while well, we, my team won quite a bit when we were 13, 14, 15 years old, we were sort of winning provincials, you know, and some of the men didn't take too kindly to that. And it wasn't my mission to, it didn't matter to me if they were men or women. I really enjoyed coaching my teams to be the best that they could be. And sometimes that results in championships, but um, a lot of them little by little would say, you know, your ball control is so good. You have so brought elements of the women's game into our game. And, I, you know, could you come to our practice and actually talk about the back row and, and the defense your team is playing? And I'm like, have you never watched girls play before? Do you, have you ever seen how great the rallies are in women's volleyball? And it was really neat for me to a, hear that. And the other thing I think that I really love to tell people and love to tell women and girls about sport and about the last eight years that I've spent in a man's world, really, um, is that when there's coaches rooms at tournaments and you're the only female coach in an entire gym and an entire tournament and um, they're all sitting around in the circle, I'll be very honest. You walk into that coach's room and you go, oh, maybe I'm not welcome here. Like maybe I'm not. And you start to assume that all of these coaches are thinking that, you know, and we do it to ourselves sometimes. And I think it's important for girls and women to hear that we have to stop doing that to ourselves. I think we second guess ourselves. Men often of a much lesser level have no problem thinking the world of themselves and their confidence and their ability. Why aren't we like that? Why are, you know, and I even say that to myself in the mirror. Why would I ever have questioned that I belonged there coaching 16 year old boys? My goodness. But I did. And I can admit that because I think it's important for you to know that, you know, I made it to the top of my mountain in my sport and I still had insecurities and I had to actually actually fight it physically, grab a chair, set it in the midst of that circle, not in the middle, but you know, right alongside all my male colleagues in the, in the coaching room and say, Hey guys, what are we talking about? You know, and, and to set myself in there and my heart beating and, and really realized, wow, you know, they respected that. And I, I shouldn't have assumed that they wouldn't. And so sometimes I think we need to take it on ourselves as female leaders in sport, um, that we have something to offer. And I think we need to celebrate what I learned about boys in sport is they're allowed, and we allow girls to too, but I want girls to hear this. Boys, they wanna, they wanna play. Girls, we should play. And a water break, girls sit around, we chat. And actually I like that, you know, I love to chat, you know, as you can tell. Uh, but boys, they take a two second water break and the balls are everywhere. And the first time I started coaching boys, I was not really that impressed with that. It seemed rather inefficient, but I learned, oh, we're playing. So when I've gone to girls practices now, I'm like two second water break, get the ball out, do whatever you want for five minutes. I don't care. 
whatever you want. And the girls are like, what? You know, and all of a sudden they start to light up and they start to just play. I think we need to also allow girls to play. And I learned that from the boys, you know, and I, and I think that's really cool. So ladies, be confident. Don't assume that men are thinking certain things or that other coaches are, or other players, you know, um, I think if we can instill that in our girls, that it's fun to play and we do belong on the sport court. And if we keep telling them those messages, um, I learned that myself, even though I played sports to the highest level, I actually surprised myself in some of my natural feelings. And I, and I love passing that on to women to say, we have unique, and some of the things I would see in the game were unique because we have Right. As women, I think we're more sensitive to how people are feeling emotionally, how our players are doing, how our teammates are doing. There's a place for that in all sport. And I think sometimes my boys on my teams were missing that. And I offered that to them and, and the strength and the, and the openness just grew and our, and our really our, our teams bonded so well. And I think that we had some of the best experiences uh, because we brought, I, I you know, I was able to bring the uniqueness that women bring into a male dominated sport in terms of where I was coaching. So I can't say enough, ladies, we offer a lot. And if we can get more women in that leadership role and in coaching, man, we offer a ton. And uh, I'm coming over back to the girl side. My boys have graduated. They don't need me anymore. And I'm just so thrilled. And I, I don't know where I'm going to plug in, but yeah, we, we need to get our young girls loving what they're doing. And, um, and just loving sport and, and feeling like they belong. And Amber, I can see you nodding a lot. What have you learned from the boys as Michelle has so articulated there and just some excellent points? What have you learned that you know, you've taken with you? Exactly, exactly what Michelle was saying when it, that's what I kind of touched upon earlier when I said, you know, I really try to get the whole fact that I'm a female out of my head when, when I show up at the racetrack because like Michelle said, having that assumption that people are going to think certain ways and, you know, sometimes they do, and, but that you can't control that. All you can do is control your mindset. And um, that's why when I was younger, I, I would feel insecure that I was a girl. And I'm like, I need to get that out of my head. I'm just a driver and I'm here and I'm doing what they're doing. And I'm just as good as what they're, what they're doing. And um, so I think, I think that's huge. And now how I kind of translate that going to new teams or working with new crew is when I talk to them, you know, I have to kind of set the tone of what this is going to be. And I do that by saying, Hey, I want you to treat me exactly how you would a male race car driver, because I'm a driver. Don't treat me any different. I'm the exact same way. And if something's not working, we'll reassess, we'll adjust. Um, these are the things that I need as a driver. And, you know, you really have to take control and, and I, you know, it's, I mean, Michelle said it, Michelle said it the best, but um, yeah, it's, I think it's really just being sure of yourself and confident and that comes with time. And I think it comes with age and experience, but um, just, just don't assume what others are thinking and kind of show up for yourself and, and show up proud and confident and, and people read off your energy too. So um, they're going to give you that respect. You know, the, the biggest thing with being a female in male dominated sport is, the fact that a lot of times you aren't taken seriously at first i'll say you know they look at you and they're like oh what's this girl doing here like oh she's gonna get a last or whatever and then you go on the track and they're like holy crap this girl can, can kick some serious butt you know so sometimes it you gotta silently shut them up um but uh you know that's kind of the whole never judge a book by its cover Absolutely. Work hard in silence. Let success yeah. be the noise. One of my favorite yeah. things. Ladies, we're just going to take a quick break here. We want to hear once again from our value title sponsor, Bison Transport, and we'll be back. Um, so I was at the top of the track, and you can just see going into corner one is just, it dives down. And you can't see anything else. You just know, okay, this is going to be intense and uh, went down. It felt like I got thrown around in a garbage can. That's the best way I could describe it. And just the, the pressures are really, really tough and they just drag you down to the bottom of the sled. You can't see anything. We'll have the maple leaf there. Nice. With our number. Yeah. Or is it number maple leaf? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> 
You never know what you're going to be great at until you actually try everything. And just because there's maybe not socially accepted to do something, it doesn't matter. You got to still try that because, you know, it could bring you to Olympics or it could bring you to wherever you need to go and you're going to be really happy. Rise and Transport Leadership Series. This is session three, Keeping Girls in Sports. And I have Michelle, Amber, and Allison with me right now. And Allison, we're going to change gears a little bit here. And we're going to go to, uh, we've heard my questions. Now we're going to go to the real experts and ask the audience because we have some great audience questions. And one that, um, you know, when we were talking about the rally report was mentioned, but I'd love to dig a bit deeper on this. And the question from the audience is, are there any specifics to engaging women and girls with a disability, disability participating in sport? I think this is a great example of why it's important to look beyond just gender, because we can miss some really important factors that influence uh, a person's participation. And uh, so what we heard in the rally report, and I will caveat this with the fact that it was not a large sample size that we had, and there's definitely more research that would be valuable here. But we, what we heard is that um, girls with a disability are often participating kind of similarly to able-bodied um, girls. We did see a gap start to widen though, as uh, they got older, kind of 18 plus. What we also heard was that um, confidence was more of a challenge, uh, injury was more of a challenge, and of course, body image was more of a challenge. And I think that, uh, again, unless we're designing really intentionally to create those safe and inclusive spaces that account for disability, we might miss that and we might end up leaving girls on the sideline, girls who could most benefit from opportunities to participate and to uh, you know, to to enjoy the full potential of their bodies and their 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 hearts and their spirits in the process. So, you know, we we need to really recognize that where these identities come together, it's not just like, wow, that makes you an interesting person, but it actually it can increase it increases the obstacles that they face in accessing the benefits of sport. And so. Uh, that intentional design is so important. There's such amazing resources and expertise within Canada on para sport. And we know that it's at the very top with the Paralympics, but there are just incredible folks working diligently to ensure that girls throughout the pathway are gaining access to this and the opportunity to benefit just as much as their counterparts um, from sport. So I think that the support is there, but I think we need to also recognize that um, we can't just look at sport from a disability lens, we have to look at it through a gender lens as well. And we can't just look at sport from a gender lens, we have to look at it through other lenses as well so that all girls can participate. Both sides of that coin there, they're all so important. And, you know, Allison just mentioned resources. And Michelle, we have a question for you from the audience. What resources are available to pair an older mentor with a younger mentee in the sport of volleyball? That's a great question. And I don't have a good answer for you because I don't know of one. And it's interesting because I've sort of thrown my hat um, at some teams, you know, and I, I played for the Bisons. And so I've been out of the women's side of sport for for quite a while of my sport. And so I contacted Ken Bentley at the University of Manitoba and I said, hey, I wanna get involved. I wanna come and I don't know, call me whatever you want, assistant coach, guest, whatever. So we've had some Zoom meetings and what was really cool and it's neat this question came up because just two days ago, there was a young lady, there's a young lady on that Bison team who asked her actual assistant coach, cause I'm not officially that as of yet, um, if there was a way she could get a hold of me and chat with me. And I went, yes, give her my email and my cell number and I will talk to her. And so, so yesterday I uh, got an email from her and she just wanted to talk. She goes, well, I know you're really busy, but maybe a coffee. And I said, you know what? When we can actually be together, we could do a Zoom coffee, but when we can be together, we're doing that. And so I, I love the question because it's actually inspiring me to see if we can get something going. 
because that is huge. And and this young lady, she just wants to talk about about life and about volleyball and about sport. Just chat. It's not hard. So we've already been emailing back and forth a little bit. And uh, to just say, I've walked that path. Here's how it was to be real with each other. And um, so I hope it grows. I, I wish I could tell you this is the number to call. <laughs> but maybe we'll figure that out. You know, and I just, I'm, I'm such a big believer in mentors and so many of my mentors though have been male because I'm in a male dominated industry. And, you know, Amber, you spoke to the fact that you didn't have a mentor growing up because there was really no one that you could look towards for that. And a question from our audience is what challenges did you face as a young female athlete on top of that? Uh, I think the biggest one was just not being taken seriously at first. And then once the results did come and the one, the wins came, they automatically assumed I was cheating in some way, uh, uh, cheating meaning like doing something to my car to make it go faster. Um, this is actually one of my favorite stories I'll share. So th this had happened where my competitors thought I was cheating. So one of my competitors was actually a really nice guy. And he's like, all right, if, if you all think that she's cheating, she can race my car and we'll put her in my car next week. So I hopped in his car and I lapped every single person up to second. So I actually was way faster in his car than my car. And then no one really said anything after that. But um, uh, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> Challenges that you faced as a young athlete. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing was just not being taken seriously. Um, but that comes with time, comes with results. And, you know, the sport that I'm in is super unique. Um, it's almost more of a business than it is a sport because our sport is driven on sponsorship. So I actually have to raise the, uh, the dollars in order to race. I can't just hop in a car and race. Um, I need to raise, you know, up to millions of dollars to do this. So I'm actually a businesswoman first and a race car driver second. So my, my biggest challenge through my career has been um, learning the industry, learning the teams, learning how to go about it and um, finding the sponsorship to actually do it. So I'm having to be a marketing manager and go into these businesses and talk to these CEOs and figure out where the problems are in their business and how I can integrate that into my racing to solve their problems and increase their sales and exposure. And so it's like I said before, as this sport has really built me into the person that I am and has taught me so much about all different areas of life. And, um, you know, I just, I'm so thankful for sports because of that. It just has really built me into a confident young woman that, um, I don't know what, that I would be if I didn't have it. That's excellent. Uh, so if you are a sponsor out there, I'm going to do this. Yeah. For and you get a hold of her and give her some cash. How about that? We have some really exciting news I'm sharing next week. So if you follow me on social media, stay tuned for that. Got such a tease next week, not now. Come on, girl. Come on, give us the inside okay. scoop. It's my job on media. Give me the scoop. <laughs> I will I will hint that I'm being backed by a Manitoba company. And that is Oh, we'd love to hear that. Homegrown. I can't wait to hear that news. I will be watching the old Twitter machine to find that out. Okay, Michelle, this is a good one for you because I think you'll be able to relate about this. So how would you approach Motivate, a 10 to 12 year old female who enjoys sport but is not interested in elite sports to stay involved in it recreationally, especially when her twin sister is actively pursuing and thriving in elite sport? Wow. Wow. So I feel like you might have an understanding about what this person is going through. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I do? It, it's interesting because my twin boys, they are both playing volleyball, but they've taken a different path. And the difference is that they were both very interested in competitive sport. Just one stayed really short while the other one got really tall in about grade nine. So I'm talking five foot nine or so to six foot five. Okay. So that's what it looked like with my two boys. And what I, you know, I mean, one of the things that I did with my uh, I'll call it, he's not watching this. So small, my smaller boy, my smaller twin is, I don't know. He hated that when I said that, but I just to qualify or to let you know who I'm talking about. So I, um, there was a time for two years of, of our club volleyball. They always played together until, um, my taller son, uh, my firstborn by two minutes was pulled away to, um, a Winnipeg team. We had a club team out here in Southeastern Manitoba and he got pulled away to a Winnipeg a club team. And it was all done very respectfully. And we were part of the 
part of the conversation and that coach would not have taken him if I hadn't sort of given my blessing and, you know, and he said, you know, and, and so he left and it was a very emotional time for my twins. I just, you know, if you're listening and you have this twins question, there were, there was, there was a lot of tears. Um, and because they both wanted the same thing, different than this situation. Um, but there were differences. And, and now he's sort of catching up in height and we'll see where this goes yet. But um, one has always been, they've been quite different and now on different teams. So I do know what that is and how I handled that with my second boy who wasn't recruited to play on a big city team was I just ended up coaching. <laughs> so I ended up coaching some more and coaching against my other son, uh, which was... Um, Plenty of tears in the quiet of my bedroom. I'll tell you that. Um, but for this situation, you know, if I give it some thought for the twin girl uh, that isn't into elite sport, I think what's paramount is that you celebrate what she is into, first of all, celebrate it. And I think what we miss when we think about sport is just playing sport isn't the only way that females can be involved in sport. You know, 10 to 12 years old already, maybe she gets involved in, you know, helping another team or, you know, or, or maybe she has a different role in sport. I don't know. You know, um, maybe she can see herself as on a team with her twin sister in a support role in a lot of ways and get totally into that sport that way. I know some people might think, oh, like just on the sidelines. Well, maybe not, maybe yes, but then she still pursues her interests and all of that. And I would, you know, just really let her know that whatever activity and if she loves recreational sport to give that value, um, to not forget to go and watch that sport, go and watch it just as much. And, and to let her know that there's huge value in that and uh, to, you know, just celebrate commitment and celebrate that whether it's recreational or top level sport. And that's hard to do. Society doesn't encourage us to do that. Right. Um, right. The, the, the higher the level, the more it's fun to watch or the more we think it is fun to watch. And yeah, I just think validating that second girl, like the girl that wants to be recreational, uh, validate that social networking and all of that and just cheer that on hardcore. Uh, it's hard to balance that with twins. Who do you cheer for and when do you cheer and can you be happy for the, and you can be, I think what I learned, be happy also for the, for the girl that's in the elite sport. It's okay. You don't have to, I don't think you should downplay that because you don't want the other one to feel bad. I feel like I can talk like this, the other one, cause I have twins <laughs> and but that's a little bit what we, it's what we deal with when we have two kids the same age. And so celebrate them both. Don't apologize for celebrating them. And no one has to be better than the other, but both are valid in their pursuits. I hope that helps. It does, Michelle. And I think you bring up a great point because there's one thing I say, you know, everybody who starts playing hockey, especially when you're a young man the, in Canada, oh, I want my kids to play in the NHL. And that then becomes the kid's dream to play in the NHL. And I always say to people, especially when I see young kids getting into refereeing, I say, you know what? 0.005% of players actually make it to the NHL. Refereeing, they need them. Get yeah. into it. If you're a good skater, there's other options in sport to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's such a great point, especially too for females. Like, you know, just because we might not be able to play in a professional sport, you know, Amber sport is unique to itself, but that doesn't mean that we're not seeing more female video coaches and athletic therapists and there's different routes to sport. My goodness, I'm in media. I talk hockey instead of playing hockey because I couldn't. So there's so <laughs> many ways. So I think we can encourage our young girls that there's more venues than other just being on the field. Um, you know, and I'm just going to get to you right now because we're starting to run a little short on time. But Allison, this question just came in hot right on the uh, the button here. So I'm going to read it right off my screen because I want to get to because I think it's a really good one. Because Allison, you spoke about that narrative to boys and how it's valued and they're valued in sports. So the question is, how can we change the narrative amongst parents that men are most valued in sport? Example, son sport is more important than the daughter sport. Oh, great question. My mind really goes to what Michelle was sharing, which is that um, we have to we have to demonstrate that value, right? We can't control what society is doing, but we can be aware of it, and we can choose within the family unit or within the community to to break that mold and to to go against those narratives. Um, I think that women's sport is often different than men's sport 
and I say different, not better, not worse. But, you know, we know that for a lot of reasons, you know, whether it's jumping higher, you know, boys are dunking in high school and girls aren't, and it makes the game feel more exciting sometimes or whatever the thing may be, you know, contact hockey versus non-contact hockey. There are examples all over the place. And there can be uh, this sort of subtle or not so subtle sense that, well, that means the the boys side is is more exciting it is more you know the way we imagine the sport is played and it can really lead to the devaluing of how girls play the sport and i think it really we need to again challenge that notion that there is one way of playing sport and that men do it better but really that there can be many different modes of sport and as you said michelle there's so much beauty in the in the strategy and the finesse that women bring to so many sports that's lacking in the men's side but if we're not exposed to it we don't learn to appreciate it so get out watch it bring other people to watch it celebrate it fund it um it matters as much or more for girls to be playing than it does for boys and we got to keep keep that big picture in mind Mm -hmm. keep the big picture in mind it, what we measure is medals and championships and things like that. What we should be measuring is health and well-being and what sport brings to people's lives. And as parents, we really need to re- remember why our kids are in sport. And it's really not about winning championships. It's about building the best kids we can and sending them out to the world full of confidence and skills that they can use to reach their full potential. Absolutely. Well, well said. Okay, ladies, so we're going to get to it here. This is our last question of the night. This has just been such a a great session here. I know that we could all talk for, you know, likely a couple more hours. Um, So this is an audience question, and I'm going to ask all of you. So Amber, I will start with you. What was the most important advice you ever received? And who said it? Um, so this one was not anyone in particular. Um, I follow a lot of entrepreneurs and kind of self-development type of people on social media. Um, his name's Gary V. He's pretty big. Some of you might have heard of him before. And his was uh, to never let the opinions of others dictate the decisions you make for yourself. And I just think that's so huge um, because if I would listen to what everyone has said, you know, women don't belong in racing and women don't don't belong in racing. If I listen to all the critics and all the negativity of what's been said about what I've been trying to do, I would have never made it this far. But um, I know what, I believe in my potential and I'm executing on that and I have a vision for my life and I know what I want to achieve and I don't I don't really care if anyone else sees it or not because I do and and I'll push and and push and push and push until I get there and so I just think again I'll repeat it never let the opinions of other people dictate the decisions you make for yourself you're in charge of your life you're in the driver's seat and just it's cheesy to say but honestly just believe in yourself believe in your potential, shoot for the stars. If you're willing to put in the work and be consistent, be dedicated, and you have that drive and are willing to work for it, and you can continue to do that time after time, day after day, year after year, you're going to be successful. Michelle, best advice you ever received and who said it? Um, I believe it was my university coach, Ken Bentley, um, and Shannon, my high school coach that I've already mentioned was so, they were so similar, um, and interesting woman and man, but very, very similar approaches. Uh, the word persistence. In fact, after my five years of university, I got a, uh, he, Ken always gave us these pictures and plaques of our you know, if we made it five years, um, you know, uh, in his regime, <laughs> then uh, we got celebrated in our fifth year. And on it was a, it was a quote um, about persistence and how nothing, how nothing trumps persistence. Talent comes and goes. Genius is, you know, so often unrealized and all of those things. But if you stay persistent and you take care of the everyday, and I think um, that's on a plaque for me. And it's, you know, it's here in my house still so many years after I'm done playing sport. And I share it with every single team that I coach. And um, we might not be the biggest or the flashiest or expected to win or expected to be the best. 
But if we are persistent every day, we will never go away and we will take care of what we can control. And that is our every day. And um, that advice just to be persistent. And I like to add, be persistent and do your every day when nobody's watching, because that's the magic. It's not magic at all, but there's magic in the every day, right? When you're on the racetrack, when no one's watching and you're doing another turn or whatever it is that you were trained for. And when I'm setting the 5,000th ball of the week and nobody really cares about that one. They want to see the one you do in the national championship, but you're never going to be there if you don't do the five to 10,000 that you're doing six in the morning in a dark gym when nobody really cares but you. And that's how it is in life too. And can I say one more thing to women? I think our gift, I think women have a gift at making all of those around us better. I don't know why we were born that way, but it's a thing. And you know what I think? I think that's incredible because the more you make everyone around you better, the better you're going to be. And boom, you're going to find yourself in an incredible place. And Amber and I both talked about teams and how important they are. And man, the more you work with the team that's around you, the more incredible you're going to be. Let our girls know, we don't necessarily want to be boys. We want to celebrate our uniqueness and be amazing and be valued for exactly what we bring to the table and be persistent in that. Can I add one thing to that? Mm -hmm. Of course you can. Exactly what you said with, it, it works vice versa too. With the more you work on yourself and betterment of yourself, the better you are for those around you. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Cool. You got it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, Allison, I'm going to give you the last word here. Same, same question. What's the best advice you ever received and who said it? I have been sitting dwelling on this question to see what I could come up with. I think what resonates and I'm very much inspired by Amber and Michelle in this answer is in a work context, um, you know, we were introduced to Simon Sinek's start with why. And, um, you know, the whole idea of like, why are you here? Why is what you're doing, why does it matter to you? Why should it matter to others? And I think what we've heard in the stories shared today and what I can certainly relate to as a very ordinary athlete is, and, and someone in a career who's, who's here in a career um, perspective is that if you don't know why you're there, it's probably a time to stop and check in because there are definitely those external motivators, you know, compliments from people and high fives and awards and you know those those external indicators of success but if you're if you don't understand why you're there you're not going to have the fortitude to put in the hard work when nobody's watching and to keep showing up even when times are tough and to stay focused on what matters to you and to make decisions that are true to you and not um, just what other people think are important. And I think that, um, again, sport is so good at giving you the, the opportunities to really focus in and to reflect on those sorts of things and to develop the confidence to say no when you need to say no and yes when you need to say yes and really to pursue things that matter to you. So start with why. Yeah, no, I love that, Allison. And, and you just mentioned the word yes. And I will have to say when it comes to the best advice that I've ever received is, you know, one of the things when we talk about transferable skills from sports, listen, I was an average athlete as well. I was cut from a ton of provincial teams before I made them. And it was all those no's. But what that taught me in my broadcasting career, which is another industry where you were just told no and no and no, and there's so much rejection, is that when I was just about to quit, because I think it was my third time going out with Hockey Night in Canada, at my third audition, and I once again didn't get selected for the job. Um, my cousin Ron, who was a professional athlete in the NHL, I said to him, I said, I think I'm done. I just don't think I can do this anymore. And his advice to me was, it only takes one yes. And two months later, I got a yes in Boston, which changed my career, and I moved down to Boston to work for Nesson. And from there, the next job I got was at Hockey Night in Canada. So you know what? There's advice in everything, and what sport has taught me and prepared me for, that persistency, as Michelle talked about, the value, you know, Amber saying, you know, don't look at yourself as a girl. You know, that's the same thing. When, you know, ever you can, just, you know, go in there and do the job. You know, do the job. Play the sport. Get out there and do it. You know, it's, it's all that. And 
And hopefully we can find so many ways, uh, Allison, your organization is doing such great work to help us understand what it's going to take to get lasting change so that we can keep young girls in sports. Um, ladies, this has been exceptional. We want to thank once again our title sponsor who we value so much, Bison Transport. Without you, this is not possible. Registration is free for a reason. It's because of Bison Transport. So thank you so much for supporting Sport Manitoba's Leadership Series. Um, I will say, our next session, this is a session of five, we just completed three, it's February 18th, and I'm really looking forward to this. The Black Female Coach Experience. You know, we talk about diversity, we talk about representation. It's gonna be a panel from across Canada that will educate us on their experience in sport, the unique development and engagement of Black female coaches. So we're looking forward to that. You watch for it on all those social medias and make sure you come back and join us. Uh, everybody take a little break, grab a tea or my favorite, a glass of wine, come back and do some networking with us. We have a zoom session coming up. That zoom link can be found in your event reminder email that was sent to you, or you can go to sportmanitoba.ca slash leadership capital H E R to get the link and jump on the zoom networking session. Um, all I can say, Allison, Michelle, Amber, ladies, it has been a complete pleasure and honor to speak to all of you. Uh, Amber, I will be watching your Twitter machine to see who this Manitoba sponsor is, lady. I can't wait to see it. I thank you all for your time. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Leah Hextall, keeping girls in sports. Let's all keep working towards that because there is no greater thing to do with our time. All right. Thank you so much. Be safe. Take care. Stay healthy. Take care of one another. Good night.